atypical femur fractures. This is from the OTA Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series version 5. Slides are by Dr. Bennett Butler and Am Sakipurma narrating. So let's go through an overview. So atypical femur fractures, we're going to abbreviate that to AFF throughout this slide deck, uh, are low energy femoral shaft fractures that have a characteristic appearance. We'll go through this. And they're caused by a combination of unfavorable uh, unfavorable femoral anatomy, so things like Barris and Boeing, essentially, in addition to impaired bone remodeling, and uh, that can be caused by certain agents. Frequently, but not always, it's associated with agents like bisphosphonates, um, and that's the majority of what we see. Successful treatment requires a combination of medical and surgical management. Uh, these can be tough cases in terms of uh, Delayed healing, non-union, compared to standard um, subtrochanteric femur fracture cases. Uh, mm -hmm. And and it's good to keep in mind that uh, the disease process that can cause this often manifests bilaterally. So when you uh, see this, you have to check and monitor for an atypical femur fracture, perhaps in the making, in the contralateral side. So this is uh, kind of how we're going to go through this. We'll go through uh, definition, characteristics, pathogenesis, bisphosphonates, diagnosis in this video. And in the next video, we'll finish up with treatment, surgical considerations, and uh, prognosis. So what's the definition? Um, so a femoral, an atypical femoral fracture is a femoral diaphyseal fracture with at least four of the following major criteria. And this is something that um, you know we started to notice, I would say, in the mid to late 2000s, where this started to pop up uh, and coincided with um, kind of after we had seen sort of widespread bisphosphonate use. Um, so uh, we eventually came up with some definitions. So it's got to be a fracture with minimal or no trauma. So basically like a pathological fracture. Um, for instance, like a patient with a metastatic lesion or tumor. Uh, number two, um, fracture originates at the lateral cortex and is substantially transverse in orientation. Uh, three, complete fractures may be associated with a medial spike, uh, and incomplete fractures are typically fractured only through the lateral cortex. Uh, the fracture is non-comminuted or minimally comminuted, and there's this characteristic uh, localized periosteal or endosteal thickening at the lateral cortex, or so-called beaking. So you may see minor criteria, or maybe not, general increase in cortical thickness of the femur, prodromal symptoms, uh, bilateral incomplete or complete fractures, and uh, delayed fracture healing. And we mentioned this in the initial slide as well, that you'll see a lot of these things. So Practical definition is it's a low energy subtrochanteric and sometimes femoral shaft fracture frequently associated with bisphosphonate use and typically prolonged bisphosphonate use for years with the characteristic set of features, a lateral based fracture line with thickening and beaking at the origin and this transverse or short oblique fracture, maybe with a medial spike and not very common. It. So in, it's a pathological fracture in, well, by definition, it is, it's it's not really like a, a you know, fracture from major trauma. It's due to something wrong with the bone, essentially, uh, and shares some characteristics of a pathological fracture you may get from a tumor, um, except for that, you know, beaking uh, and lateral origin of the fracture line. So this is what we're talking about. Um this right here. So if you were to take a close look at this area, you will see that, you know, this, if you were to trace this cortex down, it really does, I'm exaggerating very slightly, but you should recognize, and I'll erase that, that there is that beaking there. And if you were, well, we'll see several pictures of this. So you know what we're talking about. So you have to look for that. So patient comes in with a fracture. Um, if you sh see it short oblique subtrochanteric, uh, and look for that beaking. And then if you haven't gotten a clear history, make sure you go back and get that history uh, a little bit clarified. So how did these occur? Well, it's um, a combination of being an unfavorable mechanical environment, 
and impaired bone remodeling. Um, so insufficiency fractures typically occur with normal forces on abnormal bone. And then what we often call a stress fracture is abnormal forces on normal bone. So someone who's just stressing the bone way beyond what they're able to handle and they get a stress fracture uh, as opposed to um, just doing normal activities, but something's wrong with the bone, so it collapses or fractures. So what about that unfavorable mechanical environment? Well, we know that the lateral femoral cortex uh, in, in general in patients and uh, humans uh, experiences significant tensile stress during normal weight bearing. But if you have a relative femoral neck varus or anterolateral bowing, to begin with, then these forces are increased. So look at the left. You have a normal femur. Uh, we know that there are tensile forces along the lateral cortex amongst the highest tensile forces in the body, uh, in that subtrochanteric region in particular, with body weight. Well, if you have bowing, and it's shown on the right, um, you will have even more tensile forces along that lateral cortex. Uh, it's a little bit disproportionate. So you're a little bit of a setup. Um, so there is some evidence for this, uh, and the references are at the end of the slide deck in the next video. Uh, but in the first study, uh, the, they found the location of the atypical femur fracture was highly correlated with femoral tibial angle, that is more varus equaled a more distal fracture. In the second study, they showed an increased risk of atypical femur fracture with increasing coronal plane femoral bowing. Okay, so bowing in the other direction, but just both showing, you know, but, you know, potential for varus and bowing. In the third study, uh, increasing femoral neck varus increased atypical femoral fractures. And the fourth study here, femoral neck varus associated with subtrochanteric fem atypical femoral fractures and femoral bowing was associated with the femoral shaft atypical femur fractures but all showing this link that we kind of tried to illustrate in that previous slide. So unfavorable mechanical environment uh, might predispose certain patients to this. But in addition, um, that's not enough. Typically, you have to have some kind of impaired bone remodeling. So normally, when there are stress that potentially cause microfractures, these are healed by callus, followed by localized remodeling. But if you have impaired bone remodeling, and we'll show how that can happen. Those patients are at risk for propagation of these partially healed microfractures in high stress regions. So on the left, let's say you get an insufficiency fracture. There's, you know, um, abnormal bone or you get a you know, stress fracture. You essentially get callus formation, right? And then through rank L mediated osteoclast action, eventually over time, there's remodeling, right? Well, if that step is impaired, blocked, uh, you have medications on board perhaps that are inhibiting this, then you may have a failure of remodeling and then the microfracture um, can reform and potentially propagate as shown here. Now, look at that. You have this sort of thickening, right? You have this um, crack that's propagating through it looks a whole lot like you know that lateral cortex beaking. Imagine this is your lateral femur, and you have this beak here, right? That's what that is. Okay. So um, there is evidence of biological contribution to atypical femur fractures. Um, many studies have linked bisphosphonate use that um, inhibit osteoclast function. Case report and and. We'll show that in future slides. Case reports of atypical femur fractures with the denosumab use, which is a rank L inhibitor, and references are provided there at the end of the next video. And there are case reports of atypical femur fractures with various metabolic bone diseases, as listed here. Other risk factors, older age, the references are in parentheses here, female, sex, Asian, or Hispanic race, possibly because they have increased incidence of anterolateral femoral bowing in these populations and specific genetic mutations. So we've talked a lot about bisphosphonates. These are commonly used drugs to prevent fractures, but how do they work? 
they are potent osteoclast inhibitors and osteoclasts resorb bone. So in a way, these help to prevent fractures um, by blocking osteoclasts. So drugs like alendronate, pimidronate, etidronate, etc. Um, are commonly used medications for this. They are a first-line treatment for patients diagnosed with osteoporosis and have clearly demonstrated decreased risk, uh, rates of wrist, hip, and vertebral fractures in high-risk populations. So they really do help. They're also used, bisphosphonates, for bone pain uh, in patients with lytic bone lesions. So patients with metastatic disease or multiple myeloma, oncologists may prescribe this um, in those patients as well. So it is, a, it is also a major risk factor for the development of atypical femur fractures. And I mentioned earlier, this was something we started to recognize in the late 2000s with uh, prolonged alendronate use. And subsequent studies have demonstrated a population-wide increase in these atypical femur fractures. Well, we didn't call it back then, but we just noticed these odd fractures happening, and it coincided with the onset of widespread bisphosphonate use. So here's some numbers. Now, unfortunately, you know, the numbers, as you see, are kind of all over the map. But there is an increased risk, okay, with um, of these getting these fractures with bisphosphonate use. Uh, there is an increased uh, absolute risk as well. And the longer you use it, the risk goes up, right? So with two-year use, you see something like this. Um, with eight-year use, that number goes up substantially. And then the risk drops off after discontinuation. So if you stop the bisphosphonates, the risk of atypical femur fractures goes down. In spite of a significant increase in relative risk of atypical femur fractures with bisphosphonate use, just keep in mind, the absolute risk of getting these remains low. So, you know, we talk, this is an orthopedic lecture, you know, we're talking a lot about like what, how this happens, it's really bad, and, you know, these are challenging cases to treat, and we'll get into all that doesn't mean we shouldn't use bisphosphonates, okay? So ultimately, you have to balance the risks and benefits. Ultimately, bisphosphonates on the whole prevent far more fractures than they create, okay? So the, the absolute numbers of patients getting these is still fairly low. Um, so it doesn't mean we should not use these medications. And, you know, you can see, for instance, here how, you know, um, you know, when you're using bisphosphonates for two years versus eight years, yes, the risk of atypical femur fractures goes up a little bit. But um, but look what happens when we're not using, you know, uh, bisphosphonates. So here's without bisphosphonates, and then here's risk fractures with the bisphosphonate to use. Here's vertebral fractures without bisphosphonate, and we can drop it down to there with bisphosphonate. So we're definitely... Um, looking at a low absolute risk uh, based on the overall population benefit uh, and, and individual benefit for many patients. But maybe there's a role for a bisphosphonate holiday. We talked about how when you use it for year after year after year uh, without any end in sight, then that, that really increases the risk. So the FLEX study looked at um, continuing alendronate after five years of use and showed that that decreases bone loss, routine compression fractures, but not other fractures. Uh, Horizon study uh, referenced here showed that continuing zoledronic acid after three years of use decreases bone loss and vertebral compression fractures, but not other fractures. And um, Adler et al. recommend discontinuing uh, after three to five years if you haven't had fragility fractures. Uh, and DEXA scores remain greater than uh, minus 2.5, and you have a low fracture risk. So might need to consider a holiday or a pause or discontinuing at some point. A little bit about diagnosis. Well, this is actually really important because proximal femur fractures are very common. You may be at a facility or hospital where you see these every day. Um, you have to consider what what the history was. You always need to, right? But what you should notice is that the history is going to be different in these cases. Or, you know, if you have a patient and the fracture, you know, maybe it instantly doesn't strike you as being unusual, um, then sometimes, you know, you may miss the beaking because the fracture, the fracture is displaced right through it. But something should tip you off in the history, perhaps, that 
um, well, fracture should look like subtrochanteric and short oblique or transverse. And then you ask, oh, what happened? How did you fall? And then they tell you, well, they don't know. They took a step and just their leg gave out. And then you ask them, have you been having pain? They're like, yeah, maybe I think I have been having some pain the last couple of weeks. Uh, You may or may not get that, but oftentimes the uh, low to no energy trauma, you usually can can ascertain. Um, And then you can dig deeper and see, have they been on bisphosphonates for long term, for instance, and do they have these other risk factors to put that together? So imaging is standard AP and lateral images. Usually these are sufficient. Uh, usually if you look really closely, uh, you're going to see that beaking. Occasionally an MRI could help to develop uh, to diagnose a developing uh, lateral cor- uh, cortical stress reaction in a patient who has pain, but the x-rays are negative. So, you know, let's say, you know, you're seeing a patient in the office that this could be, a, you know, really something a primary care doctor is seeing. Um and uh, MRI might help to show something early before it starts to develop that beaking. But it's best to diagnose these before they happen. Now, as an orthopedic surgeon, you may not see them until they come in. But remember, these can happen contralaterally. So when you see that fracture and you diagnose an atypical femur fracture, look at the other side because they may very well have a, um, a, a stress, a uh, insufficiency you know, fracture that's going to lead to an atypical femur fracture in the making that you can address beforehand. So here's an x-ray of a patient on bisphosphonate therapy taken for thigh pain. Let's say this could also be a patient who had an atypical femur fracture on the other side, and you, and you diagnose it, and then you x-ray the, the contralateral side, and you see this. But there is that beaking, um, and unfortunately this patient did develop an atypical femur fracture one year later after this had been seen. Okay, here's that beaking on the contralateral side. This patient was treated with a prophylactic nail. So a lot of times, if and we'll talk about this in the next video, and you know, how to how to treat these and how to address um, when you find a lesion on the other side. So we're going to pause there, and then we'll pick up with treatment in the next video, and then finish this out.